was born in Lithonia, Georgia, March 14th, 1923. And we lived in a little two-room house, no running water, uh, surrounded by cotton fields and corn fields. And uh, my great-grandmother, she was born in 1852 before the emancipation. She was born into slavery and lived for 13 years as a slave. And she used to sit me down on the floor next to her, and she would tell me about the whippings and the beatings, and tell me about the slave master and the overseers, and she would tell me if I wanted to live to, to get to be a man, and then she would explain to don't ever refer to a black as a man because you'd get a whipping from the Ku Klux Klan. And so I have a very good knowledge of what Black people lived back in those days, and even my own was terrible, say, from the early 20s, being born in 23. I recall it like it was this morning, yesterday. It was terrible. The Ku Klux Klan, they had con complete control, they strive to control you, they decided your destiny, they decided your entire life. They would use whippings and lynchings, and you knew that if you didn't do what they wanted you to do, you were going to be whipped or killed. I remember the fear that I had I would walk up about a block from where I lived to the railroad station, and I'd walk about two blocks north on the railroad station to watch the Klan when they march. And I would see how many I, I could recognize and how many I, I knew. fear I had and when they would ride through the community my parents and everybody would blow the lamps out we had no electricity had the kerosene lamps would blow the lamps out and some people crawl under the bed I know I did the people went to school in the churches, if you want to call it school, to find somebody who could read, and you could go to the church and learn to read. So the people in the community got together, and they built a school, and the Ku Klux Klan burned the school down. I can sit and see the school blazing, I can see those flames. I can hear the grown-ups saying, they will never let us learn to read. After they burned the school down, or what, I, I lost all hope. And I joined the Navy. I wanted to get as far from the South as I could. And I, I thought that would be a way of doing it. I didn't know I was going from the frying pan to the pot, the kettle. But that's exactly what I was doing. They had uh, three descriptions of the crew, officers, men, and mess attendants. Now, the officers had a wardroom, and we would serve them at a table or what, and the crew had mess cooks and they'd bring their child down and serve them. The blacks had to stand and eat. And we would make the officers beds and uh, shine their shoes. And I did know occasions where we had to wash their officers' underwear, their socks and underwear. We would wash it because they had no laundry on board. And that was our duties. I, I felt and I knew that 
That's the only thing I could ever do. Secretary Knox got congressmen to make it a law that blacks could only serve as mess attendants. The racist system that they had, I was trained to more or less accept it all my life. I resented it all my life. I resented the cotton fields and I resented what happened in the Navy. When I went in the Navy, I resented it. But I felt that was the best of two evils. The Navy was the best of the two evils. Shall I stay in the Navy and do this and go through humiliation or what? Or shall I stay in rural Georgia and accept the, the ways of the Ku Klux Klan? I didn't know where we were going. When we left Boston, we came back and a lot of damage had been done on the ship. We were in a terrible storm coming back from Iceland. And I could hear the officers talking in the ward room and I would take coffee to the officers on the bridge. They said, well, I was going through Torpedo Junction, the area around uh, Argentia and Halifax were called Torpedo Junction. And that's where they would lose a lot of ships, merchant ships and what. They were on zigzag courses and radio silence and things like that. It was really, really storming there, the sleet and the snow. And I could hear him. I heard the executive officer say, this is going to be a rough one. That morning, I came out on deck on top of the rest of them there, and I, I thought we'd hit an iceberg or had been torpedoed. I didn't know what. They turned the light on, the searchlight, and when they shine it around, I saw those cliffs. I said, oh my God, you know, what has happened here? And I remember one fellow came up from down below and he didn't have his shoes on. And when he stepped out on the deck, he froze it. His feet froze to the, the plates, the steel plates, and he couldn't move. And some of the fellows grabbed him and tried to pull him, you know, off or what. And it just left the soles of his feet on the deck. It just pulled all the soles of skin off his bottom of his feet. The sleet and rain would hit you, and every time a wave come, it would wash them over. A few times I almost got washed over, but I was holding on for dear life. You could see the wave coming, it looked like it coming in threes, you know. And uh, you just hold on, and everybody was wet, and ice was forming all over the body, and it would wash somebody over every time, and you would look at them. Looked like little rats in the water. Water was all black then from the oil. And to see them just being bashed against the rocks, and the rocks all around, and the waves would just get them and bash them. You could see body parts flying off and things. It was terrible. I knew I'd die if I stay on board ship. I remember looked up at that cliff and said, man, how am I going to get up this cliff? And they said uh, Bergeron had gone up. Here was a situation where a young sailor had scaled uh, the cliffs of Jamers Cove, found his way about a mile and a half to the one light that was in existence in the area, and that was the, on the tipple, as they call it, of the mine shaft. And he saw that light, and he was directed there by that light, and he found those people, Mike Turpin, who was on the site, rushed in and uh, said that, that he had just received a visit from a stranger who had come out of the snow and announced that there was an American ship in serious trouble in a place called Chambers Cove. Within a matter of half an hour or more, I guess they had the mine shut down. They realized that with the weather uh, as it was, uh, that any problems in Chambers Cove, above all places, would be uh, a, uh, an 
unfortunate place to be under these circumstances. There was no mining that day, and all men went to Chamber Cove. What a frightful sight it must have been, because they told me afterwards, some of the men told me, like even my brother told me, it was just comparable to a beehive, with hundreds of bees clinging to the hive. See the hull of the trucks, and, and just men, 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 just clinging. And then the sad part was a big wave would come, and so many would disappear. When I decided to leave the ship, I knew that the Truxton was breaking up, and I was near freezing then. We could see the top of the cliff by this time, and you could see a fence like. I say, I'm going, and over the side I went, and there was about four or five sailors on the boat, and they pulled me on board. And away we went to shore. The raft capsized just before we got there, but we did make it ashore. Once I reached the beach area, I said, I might as well die. So I knew I, all I had to do was close my eyes to die. I knew if I closed my eyes, I was dead. And as I was Lying down, I got down on the ground there. I heard this voice say, get him up, don't let him lay there. And this hand reached for me and I looked up, I knew it wasn't a sailor because of the clothing he had on. And I looked at the white face and said, man, to myself, I didn't speak out. I said nothing. I said, here's somebody that wants to help me. And, and I thought about George, I said, that was the Ku Klux Klan. They said, let the nigga die. And probably would have stomped me in the face or neck to help me hurry and die. Uh, and when they, he pulled me up, I looked him in the face, but I didn't say anything. I just looked him in the face. And I said to myself, this is it. And it, it was like giving me a shot in the arm. And that was the beginning of the change. trying to go around uh, a crevice like of what and climbing up there going up there and everything is not clear on what happened going up there but I remember the top and I remember on this sleigh and this horse I remember the fellow beating this horse and I guess I passed out again. And the next time I woke up, I was at the mine, uh, Iron Springs Mine, on this table, stock naked. All the sailors were laid out on tables in the dry, eh? probably seven or eight tables. And the ladies were washing them and sponging them, you know, warm water and soap and trying to get them cleaned. And anyway, you must remember, back in 42, uh, very few people in St. Lawrence had ever seen a black. I opened my eyes and I looked around and I saw about four white ladies. When I looked up and saw those white ladies and looked at myself, with me being naked there, I had more fear at that moment than I had when I jumped in the water. I had heard about so many people being lynched, you know, for even looking at a white woman. And here I was, stock naked on this table, and here these, these women were rubbing my naked body. The fear that I had then is, is indescribable. Well, then they came to the homes and they had to be cleaning the game. And it was utterly impossible to get the 
the crude oil and it was said turn into tar from their eyes and their nostrils and, and their ears. It was re really, really sad. So um, anyway, this, this lady was here and she said, my goodness, she said to one of the other ladies. She said, this poor fellow, she said, I'm telling you, she said, he's certainly got some of it, some of it into him. It's gone right into his pores. She said, I cannot get it off. I'm scrubbing, she said, but I can't get it off. So anyway, by this time, the poor fellow had regained consciousness. And, and, and when, when I heard them say, gee, the oil is, they were rubbing my hand, say it's in his pores, uh, what uh, I spoke up, I said, that's the color of his skin. And, and they said, we'll, we'll take care of it. And, and they kept on massaging my body and everything. And they were, giving, they were giving me rum, I believe, and a spoon, a teaspoon of what then. Later on, they was giving me hot soup and they was holding me in their arms like an infant. When the rescuing was completed, there was other chores to do, to bring them to the homes and, and to get them, even the ones who were victims, to brought to the first aid station and cleaned up and, and uh, ready for burial. And then there was another group of people who had to make uh, coffin after coffin after coffin after coffin. Everybody just fell into the role they had to play. You see? And now there's uh, two of them particularly who were extremely sick. Uh, Jim Siemens was one of them. Uh, Lillian Loader's daughter was there at the meeting. Remember that first day? Well, she really nursed him. He was really sick and he had pneumonia. And uh, the next day they came to take him, the Navy. And uh, she said, you're not going to take them. Are you willing to take a sick man like him and take him outdoors? I'm not giving him up. He's staying with me till he's well. And she would not, so they, they were down there with a couple of medics too. And they went, they, they left the gym with her, and she did nurse him back to help when they finally came, and she, you know, about four or five days afterwards, and they were taking him out without a cap. She said, don't, don't you have a cap for him? And she, and she wouldn't let him leave without a cap, although he was on the stretcher, but she went back and got the cap and, and put on his head.